So just to give a little context what is going on, after asking him about his many work with conventions, in fact he has been to almost 12 conventions in the past two months, that is why it has been a back and forth between us and uh, getting him on the show, and his early work with Robotech where he got to be three of the main characters in the original Robotech show, and an experience of being um, at a convention where he had no no memory of being on the show or who he was, but of course, the fans, as fans always are, knew exactly what he was and, you know, what he what he's done in the show. And so, um, we're going to go into this interview now, uh, where he is talking about a character from Living Daylights. Um, his experiences, just so you know, are usually about him and his wife. Both are in the industry, both go to conventions together, and they work together quite frequently. Okay, now let's unpause this and get to the interview with Richard Epcar. Um, let's see, where is it? Virginia Hay. You know Virginia Hay? Um, if she's on, um, Living Daylights, then yes. She was, uh, let's see, what was her? She was in Farscape. That's like her big uh, thing that she was in. But anyway, she played, she played his, his girlfriend in the movie, and I happened to have a, a picture of us together because I was at another convention that was a spy convention and all these Bond girls were there and I took pictures with everyone. And so I happened to have this picture with me and I showed it to him because I, I knew he was going to be there. And he's looking at it and he goes, uh, he goes, who is, it? you know, it's like he spaced out. And I thought, <laughs> even these guys do it. You know, the, the guys that are on camera, they, they forget stuff. So I thought that was kind of interesting, but I, I try not to do that because I know it's important to the fans, you know, and, and that sort of thing. So. But the, don't worry, the fans at conventions will, will, will keep you straight no matter what. You know, you might have forgotten one, you know, a one-line part you had in a, in a movie, but they'll tell you exactly what you had and when you had it and how important that one line was to their last. They will. It's unbelievable. It's, you know, they're they're amazing. I was at a convention one time. Uh, this is years ago, of course. And, I, you know, um, basically, I was uh, talking about a few of the characters I did. And I said, you know what, I, I really can't remember any, any more stuff. And a guy raises his hand in the back of the room. I said, yes. And he's... He stood up. He proceeded to uh, to name off about uh, two hundred different parts that I was I was unbelievable. I said, "Oh my God, you know this is uh, incredible." So, I mean, they're really on top of that stuff. Okay, one of the main things which I know you've you've done is you've uh, done the dubbing for a lot of uh, Japanese anime. Yes. Um, do you find it particularly difficult, or is it pretty easy to do the dubbing when it comes to to anime and video games? Since you know, that's what you've done done a lot of your career with, you know, I've done a lot of it, and, and uh, uh, I don't find any difficulty at all with it. To tell you the truth, occasionally you'll have a tough time making something fit, making it look like it, it's what they're saying, and make it sound natural. So that's the real trick to dubbing. Um, but uh, like I say, I, I'm a drummer, and there's a there's a real timing and rhythm to this stuff. So uh, for me, it's easy. I think anyone who has a musical background has an easier time of this stuff. I know there's like a lot of even big stars that come in and have a, a, a horrible time uh, trying to even loop themselves because it just, you know, it's very tough. And, uh, you know, I, it's funny. I just I, I just did a thing on, uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about this, but I'll talk about it anyway. It's uh, Warehouse 13, which I play Thomas Edison on. And uh, I had to, uh, had to go and do some ADR on it uh, uh, yesterday. And... Uh, you know, it was just, it was wild. They, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a little different to, to, uh, to loop yourself than to loop other people. So, or other, you know, cartoons. So that was kind of interesting. Um, that doesn't happen all that much, but, uh, yeah, it was fun. It was really fun to do that. Have you ever had a, a dubbing job where the dialogue is just so out there that you just say, screw it, um, just say something and we'll get it out there. And it doesn't matter if it matches the, the mouth or not. I just get something that fits. Well, uh, I've had directors direct me that way, but if I'm directing, I, I won't, I won't settle for that. I'll, I'll find a way to make it work and, uh, we'll take our, you know, we'll take the time and make it, make it look right. Because to me, there's nothing worse than really bad dubbing. And there's a lot of that out there. Tons of bad yeah. dubbing, especially when it comes to anime. Well, there's tons and tons of bad dubbing. And the problem is that most people that do it don't really know what they're doing. And, uh, you know, even, even recently, uh, I just worked on this project where the director had no clue what he was doing and basically 
he wanted me to just say what the translation was. And the translation doesn't fit. You have to adapt the translation and make it fit the the lip flaps. And he didn't do that. This was a live action thing. So in live actions, it's even more critical because you have to make every every mouth movement work and make it look like that person speaking English. Because to me, there's nothing worse than a movie that looks dubbed. And, uh, you know, so when I do these movies, I've done Academy Award winning films. I've directed and written them into English. And, uh, uh, you know, with, with my movies, uh, when I do them, you forget you're watching a dub movie. And I think that's, that should be the goal of all that, all this stuff that's dubbed, you know? What are some of the examples of the ones that, um, that you've dubbed? Because I know, like, examples of bad ones would be like, at least my generation would be like really early Dragon Ball Z where they, you know, lost the voice actors after season one and said, hey, you camera guy, do this voice and you do this voice and just get something out there because they had no one else to do it. But what are some of the ones that you've been able to direct and, um, to the dubbing at least? Are you talking about uh, uh, movies or, or cartoons or both? Uh, we'll say movies. Like you just mentioned how you did some Academy Award winning dubs. So what are some of the ones um, that you've dubbed that way? Okay. Well, I have uh, I did a film called Kill Bullio, which was hilarious. Uh, I did a Zoomy one and two. I don't know if you heard of that. Fearless is one. Okay. Uh, Taigugi, which was a wonderful Korean film. Uh, I did Old Boy. A lot of people know that one. Crimes of Father Amaro. Um, I did uh, Blue, uh, Betty Blue, Velvet Revolution. Uh, I mean, I've done uh, The Returner, which was a very cool one. Uh, some of the Academy Award ones I did was uh, Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, uh, Bella Pock, uh, Cinema Paradiso, uh, Fencing Master. Um, you know, I've just, I've done literally hundreds of film, foreign films into English. And then, you know, I've done a lot of, uh, I've directed a lot of uh, animation as well um, that are foreign uh, films, such as Dogs in Space, which is a great, I don't know if you get a chance, they're, they're showing it now. It's a 3D uh, uh, animated feature about the, the first Dogs in Space that Russia shot into uh, space. It's pretty cool. Um, of course, Ghost in the Shell 2, Innocence, I wrote and directed that and played Bakuto on that. Uh, an original uh, animation thing called The Reef, which I directed and uh, with an all-star cast. And then, of course, I did the, the Robotech Shadow Chronicles, which I co-directed that and played Vince Grant in that. And, you know, just it goes on and on and on. I, I, have, <laughs> I have a very, very long, long, long resume. Yeah, your, your IMDb is, is quite long. But this leads us into one of the, the questions which one of our listeners has. It says, could you go through the process of coming up with a voice for a role? The first being as a director, leading you through and, you know, leading people through voices. And the second being a voice actor. So, like, how do you come up with the difference between coming up with a, a voice as a director and then a voice actor? And how do you mix the two now? Well, you know, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Uh, first of all, I've been doing this a long, long, long time. <laughs> So for me, it's, it's, it's almost kind of, uh, instinctual. And, uh, you know, when I, when I go into audition, let's say for a character and they have a picture of the character, I will, I don't really even think about it. I basically, it, it's kind of a left brain thing. It just basically comes out whatever, whatever I think is that character is going to sound like will come out of my mouth. And basically, that's how I work on that sort of thing. When when I don't have a picture of the character, uh, then you have to go by the description of the character. What what who is this guy? What is his deal? What you know is he is he aggressive? Is he shy? Is he is he bold? Is he you know you have to kind of take all this into account. Does he have a, a deep voice, a high voice, a, a gravelly voice? Uh, you know you have to think about all this this stuff and what what does this character sound like? And then you, you come in, you come in and you do it. Now, sometimes you'll come in and the director will tweak you a little bit, say, I like that, but let's try it with a little this way and go a little that way. And we'll, you know, you'll play with it for a little bit until you get the voice down and then you'll start recording the character. Um, when I, when I direct or cast, it's kind of funny. I know this sounds really kind of simplistic, but a lot of times I will bring in people that remind me of those characters and, and nine times out of 10, it's just amazing to me. They'll they'll sound perfect for those characters. It's just kind of a weird thing, but it, it works every time for me. We were talking to uh, well, at least 
he, he, he knows you quite well. Um, one of your friends, uh, Dave Fenoy. Yeah, he's awesome. The Hulu guy. Um, and he was telling us how, you know, some of the times he'd be up there auditioning for a role and they'd want him to do something outlandish and he wouldn't be able to get the voice right. So they'd just be something along the lines of, uh, oh, darn, I forgot his name. Um, he's Klaus, an American dad. He does mostly creature effects. He's in Clone Wars. Uh, D. Bradley Baker. D. Bradley Baker. Like, hey, D, just come over here and do this. And he'd do it on his first try. Do you ever have any incidences where you're trying to do a voice and there's just, just a someone that you just can't get what the director wants, and so they just like, hey, D, get over here and uh, do a noise. <laughs> no, I've never had to have D replace me, fortunately, but uh, I, I do work with D on uh, Legend of Korra, which is on Nickelodeon, and D, yeah. D is a phenomenal guy. Not only is he a, a wonderful actor and, and great at what he does, but he's also a really nice person and wonderful person. And uh, I came in one day, I was doing a, uh, a game right before uh, um, coming in to do... Uh, Legend of Korra, I think it was um, Black Black Ops, the second one, and there's a lot of screaming in that, you know, <laughs> and uh, so basically I blew my throat out. I was screaming for four hours, and I came in to do Legend of Korra, and I had no voice at all, and uh, and Dee was just, you know, wonderfully supportive, as was uh, Andrea Romano, the director on the show. It was, he was just great, and, you know, I had no voice. I said, look, Andrea, my voice is shot. And I said, if you want me to come back, I'll come back another day. I, I won't even charge you. I just, you know, I, I said, I have no voice and I'm really sorry. And she goes, well, actually, it's not for your main character, the chief. I play Chief Sycon on Legend of Korra. I said, there's a, there's a, there's a couple, you know, I play a bunch of these other little characters. And, uh, she said there was a guy at the docks who's kind of a bad guy. And she said, let's see if we can just, we just need to pick up a couple of his lines. Well, my voice sounded like this. I had like no voice at all. And I said, okay, let's do it. So I tried doing it. I said, you know what? I said, I like the voice for this guy. Let's redo the whole part. She goes, no, I can't ask you to do that. I said, no, I'd like to. And so it wound up that this, this voice, oh, the guy sounded like this and he was on the docks and it was just, it worked so great for this character. It was like one of those weird, weird things where it all worked out and, uh, and everyone was really happy about it and excited about it. So as long as I, I guess, as long as I don't have to go back and, uh, pick any lines for him, I'll be okay. <laughs> well, you mentioned how a, a lot of the, these voice actors, you know, like D. Bradley Baker, are, are all really nice people. Like, we've had an opportunity to have, you know, you're on the show, Dave Fenoy, yeah. we've had James Arnold Taylor, Stephen Stanton, Anna Graves, Catherine Tabor, and so on. Mm -hmm. A lot of them from Clone Wars, of course. Right. And basically, we have yet to find a voice actor who is not basically the nicest person you can meet. Because, I don't know, maybe it's something to do with the industry where you just basically have to do whatever they want you to do and just be willing to work with people that can makes all these nice people want to do it. But this just seems to be that it's an industry full of nice people. Thank you. And I, I have to uh, second that, uh, that vote because, uh, the thing is, you know, I know when I'm directing, I, I have a very limited time and, uh, I have to get it done quickly. I have to get it done well. And, uh, I, you know, you want to work with people that are going to be, you know, first of all, that are going to be professional, that are going to be fun to work with, that are going to be nice and make your job easier. And when somebody comes in with an attitude who, who is not nice and who, uh, you know, just gives you a hard time, you basically don't want to bring that person back in again. So, uh, I think, I think it behooves people, you know, just as a human being to be a pleasant person, you know, not, not out of a, a business reason, but just to be a, a good person, period. But, but also it behooves you from a business standpoint because, you know, you want to be, you want to be friendly. You want to be the guy that people want to work with, not the guy that people dread to work with, you know? That, that, that's true. I know, you know, I've met, um, James Arnold Taylor. I got to do an interview in person. I got to do an interview like this with him. And he is one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And he's just willing to, to talk with fans. He's willing to talk with anyone. Even if he has two minutes, he'll talk with you for the two minutes he has. Yeah. And I know that that you know it's in his personal life. It's on it's on screen. You know, just the type of people he is. Right, right, yeah. That's you know it makes and, a big difference. It really does. And I, and even, I have um, to say, most of the people I've I've worked with on camera have been really super nice too, for the most part. There there is uh, there is uh, that you know one or two or three people that are people you hope you never ever run into again. And then there's sometimes when I'm when I'm directing, I've directed a lot of games and stuff like that too, where the clients have it in their head that, oh, we got to get a big celebrity to do this. And I've done that where I've directed some big celebrities and, and some of them were, were just horrible to work with. And then other, other ones were, were lovely and wonderful. So, you know, it depends on the person, but the people that were horrible, I'll never ever want to work with them again, you know? 
But when it comes to voice acting, you know, there are, uh, you can say in term, in quotes, big celebrities, because there's like, I know, sorry, it's female school, there's like uh, Jennifer Hale, who we've had on before, and she's just awesome. Mm-hmm. We had her on right after Mass Effect 3 came out, like the day it came out, she got on, which is surprising. And then um, you've had like, you know, Mark Hamill's, who people know as Luke Skywalker, but when he's on, you know, voice acting, he's sort of a god, kind yeah. of, for most people. <laughs> and so you have all these, yeah. you know, big I, names I, they can you know, use, but... I, I also do the joke. Which Joker did you? Which Joker did you do? Because I know there's uh, Joe DiMaggio, and then there's Mark. Yeah, I do. Uh, I did the Joker on Mortal Kombat versus DC Universe, and uh, and there's rumors that I'll be doing the Joker again, but I can't talk about that. But uh, that that is an incredibly fun character to do, and uh, um, uh, an iconic character. When you get to do those kinds of characters, I've actually I've replaced several people. You know, through my career, they brought me in to replace people. And I've I've replaced. Um, um, Billy Zane in uh, Kingdom Hearts uh, on Ansem. I, I, and, you know, it was it was kind of interesting because in the beginning there was a lot of backlash about it. And now I have, you know, a lot of fans who really like what I'm doing. So, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's always tough when you hear that. I mean, it, it, you know, and once again, going back to Bond, being the Bond fan that I am, I remember, you know, when, you know, Sean Connery did it, he was, he was the greatest. And then, you know, when they started replacing him with all these other guys, it, you go, well, he never, never quite measures up to Sean Connery. So I completely understand, you know, people's uh, feelings about that. Okay. So while we're on Bond, this weekend, a certain Bond movie gets released in England and then in, uh, I think two weeks it gets released here. Yeah. So what are your uh, expectations or hopes for uh, Skyfall? I'm I'm totally stoked to see it. It looks awesome from the trailers, and uh, it looks like a really good one. Um, and I'm hoping it is. I mean, it. it, it I lo- I really like the way they're going with the character, and I like that they're making him a lot more dangerous and gritty. And I kind of like that. I just I just hope they bring a little bit of the you know the sophistication and humor and the things that make Bond Bond back into the the franchise. Yeah, being that they've had four years to work on a script, and they have Sam Mendes being there. He was Academy Award winning director and they they've had a lot of time to work on it so it's not it's not a rushed project so hope it looks really good and being that it's a prequel it leading awesome. up to what we know it, it, i hope they do bring in a sophistication into because honestly i we had timothy dalton and mm-hmm. he needed more sophistication in his at least humor part and i like the fact that they're yeah. starting to work more humor into the newer ones which we we do need in bond because it's bond yeah He's supposed I mean, to be silly. Like, otherwise it's like an english jason Bourne, you know it, you know i mean bond is a particular character and i think I, I really liked the first one. I thought Casino Royale was a great movie, but I, I think they, the, particularly in the second one, Quantum of Solace, I think they pulled out a lot of stuff out of his character that makes James Bond James Bond. And I think that, you know, he's he's a particular character, and that's why he was popular. And he's, he's lasted so long, and I think to try to mess with that is, is dangerous, <laughs> you know? So what are some of your, your favorite Bond movies, then? If you could say, we'll say three, since if I say one, most people start arguing with themselves. Well, you know, it's tough. I, I really, there are some really good ones. I think Goldfinger is like probably my favorite all time James Bond movie. And, uh, I do like, uh, I do like From Russia with Love. I think that's another really good one. Um, I do like Living Daylights. I mean, that's the Timothy Dull one. That was the first one. Second one I just like, uh, are you doing blow in the studio? What? <laughs> uh, sorry, one of my roommates was blowing his nose. I said, are you doing blow in the studio? No, no, my roommate was blowing his nose. I know, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of uh, some of the other ones. I I, uh, I like Golden Eye. I thought that was a good one, and I and I like Pierce. I thought he did a nice job. I just, uh, you know, and Pierce always wanted to do a gritty one, and they never would let him do it. And I would love to see what he could do in a gritty one. And I like the the beginning of uh, uh, the last one, which was Dying Another Day, when they when he got captured. I thought, oh, great, now they're gonna do. Some something really different, you know, and then, of course, he, he got traded and went off to the same formula again, and so I just thought, you know, that kind of sucked. I, I was I thought they had a great opportunity there with him in prison, and, you know, let's see Bond escape from a, a you know, a deadly situation. I thought that would be kind of interesting, you know. Yeah, I, I had hopes for dying another day, but once you start getting to the bit with uh, the director was saying how his goal with that Bond one was the first to bring, you know, the Ursula Andress moment back, and then second to be the first to show sex or something on screen. I'm like, well, what's the point of showing that? Bond is Bond. Yeah. He gets with all the ladies you cut off and you hit play, plays with toys and gadgets. He doesn't need to be 
realistic as, as much. He doesn't need to be, you know, gritty. He doesn't need to be dirty. He's just Bond. He's fun. Yeah. And when you focus on the wrong thing, the movies don't get as fun. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, that, that's the, that's the kind of the, the dichotomy of the whole thing is that you've got people that really enjoy the entertainment humor value of it, like with Roger Moore. And then you have uh, the people that kind of like it a little more dangerous. I, I, I actually kind of like it a little more dangerous, a little tough. And, uh, but I love, <clears throat> I love the, you know, the whole thing for me was when I, you know, when I was a kid, it was like an adventure and it was like going uh, on a, on a fantasy and you got to travel to all these exotic locations and, and, and feel like you're part of something really kind of, you know, cool and interesting. And I think that, that there was, it was magical. And I just, uh, I hope they can bring that magic back to it. So. Well, some of the films have proven you can have the best of both worlds. Like, you know, you have, uh, you only live twice where, you know, it's, it's one of the more dangerous and better shot ones, like as far as action goes, because there's a lot of action. And then you have ninjas at the end. Yeah. So you have the fun, random fun things in there. Right. We have, you know, GoldenEye, as you mentioned, which was a lot darker and grittier than the later Prep Bros and ones. But at the same time, though, it was still very much Bond. Yeah. He was having fun, and the, we had the cars and the gadgets and, and the fun with it. Right. I thought that the GoldenEye was the, the best... Uh was the best uh, written script of the four that, that Pierce did. Yeah, and uh, Martin Campbell showed twice that he can, you know, save Bond. He brought it back with GoldenEye, yeah. and then he brought it back with uh, Casino Royale. And Casino Royale was great, and I was, I've always wanted, because I, you know, the book is, a, is an excellent book, and it was his first, it was Ian Fleming's first book. And uh, I was really kind of saddened when they just made a horrible spoof out of it. It was terrible. <laughs> the Woody Allen, not Woody Allen, the... Yeah, it, well, it was Woody oh. Allen, the Woody Allen. Yeah, Woody Allen, David yes, Niven. one of the six Bonds. David Niven, who, in interestingly enough, was uh, was Ian Fleming's first choice for Bond. So, um, thankfully, that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like... Then there's I like one Bonds like George Lazenby that just gets short shrift, even though his he wasn't, really wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad, but uh, that was the one I think Connery should have done, was uh, Honor Majesty's Secret Service. That would have been great. And then let let Roger Moore do uh, Diamonds Are Forever. Because it was more of a spoofy, kind of, a, you know, rompy. Yeah, Diamonds Are Forever was Sean Connery's worst by a long shot. Yeah, yeah, that and... Doesn't fit him. Yeah, no, that's why I thought Roger Moore would have been better there. So now um, we're going to shift back to some of the work you've done. <laughs> so you've done some uh, some work on some absolutely massive games of late, where games like The Old Republic and Skyrim. Yeah. Um, yeah. How did you feel being able to work on these projects, being as big as they are, especially The Old Republic, which is like the biggest uh, voice work forever for a video game of all time. So uh, what were, you know, what were the voices you able to contribute? Since I know a lot of the times if you look at your resume, it says voices. Yeah. It doesn't say what they were. And what's it like working with Bioware and Bethesda? Is there any difference working with them? Or what's it like working on a game that size? Um, let me, uh, let me look, because some of these, uh, some of these characters, you know, it's weird. It's like I've done about maybe 50 different characters on World of Warcraft, for example. And I can only remember uh, Ingvar the Plunderer is the only character I remember. And the only re reason I remember that character is because uh, when I went into audition, I started singing Ingvar the Plunderer, Ingvar the Plunderer. And, and it cracked up everybody. And I, I, they, had, they, they laughed so much, they wanted me to do like a whole song about Ingvar the Plunderer, which I did. I just made it up on the spot. And they recorded it, and they sent it to Blizzard, and they were laughing their asses off. They just gave me the, the part because they just thought that was so funny. <laughs> um, the uh, the uh, and, and and same thing with the Star Wars games. I play several characters in that, and unfortunately, I'm an idiot. I didn't write any of them down. I should have. But let me see what I have on here because I uh, uh, let me see what. Uh, hang on, let me see here if it tells me anything. Skyrim was an awesome game. I mean, I just, you know, I, I got to tell you a funny story about Skyrim. I was, uh, I was at the, uh, the LA, uh, expo and I was having lunch with some friends. Uh, you know, we were going to do a panel, a voice acting panel and we're outside and I'm looking and there's these three huge, huge buildings. And across the three buildings is this one humongous poster and I'm looking at it, and there's this big guy with a, you know, he's just like this big, uh, he looks like a, a Viking. And he's sitting there with this huge shield, and he's got a, you know, sword. I thought it was a thing for Thor, the movie, you know. And I look up, and it says Skyrim. 
Elder Scroll V. And I'm going, oh, my God, that's this game I'm working on. And I'm going, holy crap, they need to pay me more. <laughs> but I, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe, you know, the, the excitement and the money that put into this game. It was just unbelievable. And, you know, I mentioned Mortal Kombat. Uh, and I play Raiden. He's another uh, iconic character. I play Raiden in the, the Mortal Kombat and Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe, and that's a great character. You can play the God of Thunder. Yeah. Yes. Well, there's two. There's actually two Gods of Thunder. There's Thor and Raiden. So who would win in that fight? That's a good question. Who would win? I don't know. I like to say Raiden. Uh, <laughs> I think it depends on which com- which which uh, Comic Con you go to and which fanboys are present. Exactly. Um... So let me see what uh, do they have. Uh, you asked me about Star Wars. Well, the only the only names I have, I have uh, the Empire War. I play the aggressor destroyer. I don't know what that says, but uh, Old Republic. I'm I'm uh, the senator, the Republic senator, and then I'm Captain Thuraguin. Um, and unfortunately, I you know seriously, I have like twenty or thirty more characters. I wish I had written them down. Maybe I I'll find out one day and put them on there. But. Uh, you know, like I say, we go in and we do them and we leave. <laughs> do you usually work alone on something like that? They just bring you in alone, or do they bring you in in a like a, a group? Since I know basically everyone we've interviewed who's a voice actor worked on the Old Republic because they seem to have gotten every voice actor known to man. Yeah, they well, they had a bazillion characters in that, but uh, uh, the, the uh, Will, the director on that, is he's a great, great guy, and basically uh, he he would uh, you know Skype in on. Uh, on the uh, recordings, he would be up at Lucas Ranch generally, or up north somewhere, uh, California, and uh, and we would go into the the, the studio, and the, it would be just me and the engineer, and we would go through the stuff, and he would you know tell me what he wanted and what pages and what characters, and and I think one time he was actually in Los Angeles, and I worked with him, he was a super nice guy, and uh, uh, he had me back on several several characters, which was awesome, you know. And, uh, you know, just, just wonderful, wonderful to work with. And, you know, once again, Star Wars was, uh, you know, a, a huge, you know, movie to me. And all those, all those films were just huge to me. So to be able to work on anything, Star Wars was incredible. Um, you know, and I've had a few of those in my career that I've really been fortunate about. Transformers was another thing. I grew up as a kid, as a kid watching and, and now I got to actually, uh, you know, uh, the Robots in the Sky series, I wrote a third of the series, and I played Armor Hide in that. And then on the new uh, War for Cybertron, I played Skywarp on that. So, I mean, it was, you know, it was just kind of nice when, you were, when you're a kid and you're growing up. Uh, Speed Racer, I'm a new, new Speed Racer playing Racer X and that. And, uh, you know, these, these are shows that I, as a kid, watched, and now I'm, I'm doing these, these, you know, working on these shows. So, for me, that's just really, really cool. So, uh, being a fan of Transformers growing up and so on, uh, what's it like? I'm assuming you've met Peter Cullen then and been able to work, record with Peter Cullen since you worked with Transformers recently. Have you been able to work with Peter I, Cullen at all since he's a legend? I, he and, is a, uh, he's a legend and he's awesome. And I've never met him or worked with him, unfortunately, but I was exceedingly thrilled for him when, uh, when he got the, uh, the movie. I know that Michael Bay didn't want, quote, voice actors in the movie. Yeah, he wanted Hugh Jackman in that movie. He did? Yeah, he it was originally supposed to be Hugh Jackman opposite Hugo Weaving. He was Hugh Jackman is supposed to be Optimus Prime, and then they the fans said Peter Cullen has to be there, so it's Peter Cullen opposite Hugo Weaving. Well, I know that that Michael Bay put Peter Cullen through the mill, and I know that uh, he really did not want him to do it. But you know what? Peter Cullen stole those movies. He was better than anybody in those movies, and uh, it was great. I would love to work with him one day. I have the utmost respect for him. I know, I know that when he does, when we did the Transformer games that we recorded at a certain studio, I know that he has a place that he likes to work at. So they basically recorded his stuff separately from everybody else at a different studio. So I thought that was kind of interesting, but that's kind of what, what he, he likes to do. So he's Optimus Prime. What else he's do you Optimus expect? Prime. He can do whatever the hell he wants to do. <laughs> it's kind of like when it comes to like Star Wars. If George Lucas says to do something, you go do it. It's, a, it's his project. You do what you do what he says because it's his universe. Even if he says we're going to put Jar Jar Binks in this. <laughs> hey, babe, if Jar Jar Binks is in there or Gungans in there, that means you get to work with people like Brian Blessed and All My Best who, uh, what I've heard is they're hilarious to work with. So... <laughs> 
Okay, so now we're going to work with one of your probably most acclaimed projects. Um, you've done voices in the highly acclaimed uh, Ghost in a Shell films. Yes. Um, and this it's been several over the years. And uh, this contributed a lot to your career as a voice actor. And so what can you tell us about working on Ghost in a Shell films? And what can you tell us about the live action Ghost in a Shell film, which you've spoken of before? Um, well, you know, I'm in the series as well. Let's not leave that out. That's uh, Gets, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a wonderful show. And uh, people really love that as well. Um, my first, you know, the, the Ghost in the Shell movie was basically I went in an audition and, uh, and I got the part of Bateau. And, uh, you know, I was doing this show and I'm going, this is really a cool show. I really liked it immensely. And I didn't think much of it. And then a, a couple, two, three years later, uh, I found out that there was a series and they were going to do the series. And I thought, oh, great. I'm going to do, you know, I'll do Bateau in the series. Well, they wanted to re audition everybody. So I, uh, they called me up and I said, you know, well, you know, I did the thing in the movie. They said, yeah, but we're, we're re-auditioning everybody. I said, oh, okay, great. In my head, I'm going, use. So I said, okay, I'll come in and audition, even though I'm thinking use. Anyway, I went in and auditioned and had about 200 guys audition for Bateau and, uh, they, they, Thankfully, they decided to go with me for the series too, and uh, I've been I've been playing him in just about everything. I've done the games, I've done the series, I've done all the movies, and uh, in the last one, uh, Ghost in the Shell Innocence, uh, Ghost in the Shell Two, I uh, I actually wrote and directed it uh, for the UK version, and it's a crazy story how that came about. But uh, um, <laughs> be careful what you wish for. But uh, I got to actually uh, do it, and which I what I like about it is that I actually got to play Bato for the first time the way I really wanted to play him. And it's there's nothing you know I I have nothing against the the director who directed me in the series and the films and all that. He's a, he's a wonderful guy and great director. But I you know we had some disagreements, and uh, and it's kind of nice when I am able to do it the way I want to do it. It was, it was really nice, and I I got to I got to do that one time, and it, it was nice. So what can you tell us about the, you've talked about several times a live action film or how, well, how you would like to be able to do it or your version of it. So what, what can you tell us about a live action Ghost in the Shell film? Oh, I know they've been, they may or may not do. They've been working on it for a long time. And, uh, I think Spielberg's involved with it on some level. And, uh, um, you know, I think they've just been trying to figure out how to do it, but I, uh, yeah, I would love to be involved with it on some level. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they'll, they'll, try to get big, huge stars to be all the characters. But, you know, I would love, I'd be happy if you just give me an audition, you know? <laughs> I am. Hopefully they don't do what they did with Acura, where they put someone like Keanu Reeves as Tetsuo, who's supposed to be a bit younger than, uh, I don't know how old Keanu Reeves is now, but he's not a teenager yeah. in Neo Tokyo. <laughs> well, you know, and, uh, you know, it just, it's kind of annoying, you know, when they do that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, physically, I mean, I'm, I'm right for this guy because I'm a big guy. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, and I could certainly get pumped up to play him. But, um, he, uh, you know, he's one of these characters that's kind of near and dear to my heart. And, you know, whatever they do, I just hope they do a good job of it. It's a, it's a wonderful concept. It's got a wealth of stories. Uh, they could really do a, do a lot with this thing. I mean, it could be huge. It could be a huge franchise. If they're smart, they'll, they'll do it and do a good job of it. And, uh, and hopefully they'll involve the, the original people who created it because those guys really know what they're doing and they, they would give it a, a really nice flavor that would be different than, you know, something we're used to seeing. So, uh, you know, maybe that's what they need to do, get get some of the Japanese directors in to do, do the live action version, you know. That would probably help. Yeah. Okay, so one of our listeners has a, has a, this question might take a while to answer, but, um, what are the differences? What are the differences between recording for TV shows, dubbing for anime, and video games? Do you prefer or to focus on any of them? If not, prefer all of them. And what are the positives and negatives of each? You know, between TV shows, anime, and um, video game voices. Well, you know, basically dubbing is dubbing. Whether you're doing it for film, television, games, dubbing basically means that there's already a project or, or a product that's in the can. So basically you're replacing a voice on something that's been recorded generally in another language. So basically they're removing the dialogue track and you're coming in and you're replacing it in English 
and you're trying to make it fit and make it sound like this guy, this character, or whatever you're playing, is saying those words and make it look like it's coming out of their mouth. So that's the trick. I mean, you really have to make it look like it's like they're saying those words. So basically, that's the trick to that. And, you know, honestly, it's a lot more difficult than doing original animation or what they call prelay sometimes. And that basically is when you go in and you record uh, a voice track. And basically, they animate the, uh, the film or, you know, movie, whatever it is, a TV show, to your voice. So that's a lot easier. Now, the, the weird thing about all this is, is that dubbing is a lot is a lot tougher, and you get paid a lot less for doing dubbing, and the original is a lot easier, and you get a lot more to do it, so you figure that out. Okay, so um, do you have any interesting stories or, or cool stories when you were recording that just the voice or role you were doing just wasn't working at all, or wasn't exactly what the director wanted that you ended up being able to, you know, Use your clout to you know to say, well, this is better than what you had in mind. Or do you have any any stories like that? Where I have a great I have a great story. It has nothing to do with that because uh, every voice I come up with is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> every voice is perfect. Every voice is perfect. Of course. So I can't. I have no stories like that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, I I don't really have it like uh, a situation like that because, as I said before, if you if you are kind of going down the wrong road, the director will kind of direct you into the right road. So. Uh, I've never had that experience, but I did have a, I have a wonderful story that I love telling the story because it just, it tickles me. Um, and it ties into all this stuff. Uh, basically, as I mentioned earlier, Billy Zane was doing Ansem in Kingdom Hearts, the game series, and he did the first one. And then for whatever reason, uh, I don't know if he wanted too much money, if he wasn't available, if he pooped in their salad, I don't know what the deal was. <laughs> But well, Billy Zane, he could have pooped in your salad. He could have, you know, he looks like he might. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, they they hired me. And the reason they hired me was because the guy who plays Ansem in Kingdom Hearts is the voice of Bateau in Ghost in the Shell in Japan. So the wow. producers said to the uh, Disney brass over here, who does the voice of Bateau in Ghost in the Shell? And they said, Richard Epgar. And they said, well, let's we're going to cast him. So that was like one of the few times in my career where I actually got hired to do a job and I didn't even have to audition for it. So I wow. go, the first day I go in to do the job, I'm in there and there's six Japanese clients and six people from Disney in the booth with the engineer. And I do a line and the engineer comes on the talk back and pushes the button. He says, uh, just a minute. And I see they're all talking amongst themselves for five minutes and they come back on the talk back and they say, can you do that a little slower? I do the line a little slower. The engineer comes on the talk back and says, just a minute. And they're talking amongst themselves for five, ten minutes. They come back and say, can you do that a little fast? So this is going on all day, and I'm, like, ready to jump off a cliff. So finally, we had a break, and I pulled the engineer aside. I said, how did Christopher Lee put up with this? He said, oh, they did it to him once. And he said, all right, I'm going to tell you how we're going to do this. I'm going to read this script from the top to the bottom, and then I'm going home. <laughs> I thought, how cool is that? I wish I could. But then I've done about six of them. Maybe I can do that now. <laughs> I guess if you were Christopher Lee, you, you could probably do that. Or I guess if they got Harrison Ford to do something, you could probably say that too, because if they made him do too much, you just leave, and then what are they going to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the problem with celebrities, see? You know, if you get a, you get guys like me, we'll, we'll be there to the, you know, to, till dawn, working our butts off, doing whatever it takes, whereas these other guys go, hey, you got it. I'm, I'm done. Bye, you know, so. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm going to go over some of the questions that make sure I've, we've gone over most of them. You talked about, um, okay, so you talked about working on Legend of Korra, yeah. which is you know one of your most recent and most highly acclaimed works. Yes. What was it like working on a sequel to a show uh, that, a recent, that had such as high acclaim as Avatar The Last Airbender? Were you nervous to be working on it? Were there challenges you had to work with being that? You know, it's 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 like a Star Wars prequel. It's a sequel to something that's very highly acclaimed and very well loved that we know with M.I. Shyamalan's movie, if you mess up, there's really no mercy. <laughs> yes, M. Night Shyamalan, a ding dong. Um, I, 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 you know, I didn't see the movie. I, I heard it was not very good, and I, I heard it, it, it let down a lot of the fans, which I think is a shame because it's such a great, uh, great uh, story and, ca you know, uh, cast of characters. Um, 
you know, honestly, before going in, I, I knew nothing about Avatar. I didn't really watch the show, so I didn't really know that much about it. Although I, I would like to go back and, and watch it now and see it. Cause, uh, you know, when we, when we record this show, I know the writing is phenomenal on this show. The, these guys do a great job. Mike, Mike and Brian, I believe, are the, are the writers and producers of the show. And, uh, they do a great job. And, you know, when I, when I've seen the shows finished after we, re we recorded them, they're just, they look, phenomenal and they just everything you know i i just love working on the show i'm very honored and and happy to be on the show and i've never worked with uh, andrea romano before and i was really really looking forward to working with her so uh, and she's a doll so i i've just uh it's yeah it's been a, it's been a wonderful experience all the way around and uh and i got to work with d and you know some of these other wonderful people um uh, it's just been incredible so uh I met Mindy Sterling from uh, the Austin Power movie. She she plays uh, she played the chief before I became my character became the chief, and you know just it's there's been some wonderful actors involved with it, and uh, it's just a great atmosphere, and it's just really fun to go in and just and you know just read your character and not have to worry about uh, lip sync or any of that other stuff, and just uh, really have fun with it. And it's uh, you know working at Nickelodeon, it's a great studio, and it's just beautiful in there, so. You know, you, you, you feel like you're, you're really at the, you know, one of the high points of your career when you go there and do that sort of work. So it's really been wonderful. Okay. So we have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, the first one is, has there ever been a voice that you really, really wanted to do that you ended up not being able to do for any particular reason? Um, I've been, I've been really, really blessed. Uh, I, like I, I said at the beginning of the interview, I've done about, you know, three to 400 different characters. And, uh, I've been just really lucky, uh, in that I just enjoyed most of it. I really have for the most part. And I've got some great, great characters to do. Um, you know, I would love to do Batman one of these days, maybe a, maybe a James Bond, uh, animation. I don't know. Oh, you know, uh, um, you know, that would be fun. Let's pause right here. Definitely not because there was a technical glitch that ate part of this next question, but because it is time for another TGC scavenger hunt. The way this works, I'm going to read parts of a roleplay found on TGC, that Big Thing Gugan Council, in the Star Wars roleplaying form. And what you are to do is I will read it, and you are to find and send me either on the Bombad Radio Facebook, on Yuku, on my email at baynathos at gmail.com, the answer on which RP it is. If you send the response the day of this podcast release, as in within 24 hours, you get 10 points. One day later, it's 9 points. Two days later, 8 points, to a minimum of 5 we have done this before on a podcast. These scores will be added up to the people that participated in the earlier round. At the end of uh, the year, we will have prizes, of course, for the winner and the runner-up. So let's get to it. It's time for the TGC Scavenger Hunt. She, of course, didn't know what her future was with a five-year-old. But, even at this age, couldn't get enough of her. Her parents had dumped her off at the temple in Nabu, and she was with the younglings most of the time. Today, though, was another story. She had been looking for her master since they were usually paired together. Though her master, of course, decided to not show up. The little tyke had a knack for finding her master in the temple, which probably annoyed her to no end, and today was no different. Stumbling into the room, a small, blonde, blue-eyed child peered about. Her little face brightened when she noticed the sulking teenager across the way. A chubby little hand wrapped around the neck of a tauntaun plushie that seemed to be through the mill of the child. She wore the youngling uniform while in the temple and obviously had part of her lunch clinging to the front. Then she noticed her. After her encounter, she had been spooked and half expected some other nightmare from the future to turn up in an unexpected, perversely innocent guise. But this was pleasant. She was younger, and she did not yet have the muscles that would drive her wild in the future, but she was certain it was her. Now, a more philosophical mind would wonder whether there was some larger purpose behind her somehow conveniently meeting many persons that would one way or another have an effect on her in the future, or whether this was just some big cosmic joke the Force was playing on her. 
She saw the battle rage. It wasn't like she had a sudden realization of her role as a Jedi, nor did she get a surge of power. What she did get was a feeling of respect for it. The other woman had warned her about this, and she had not listened. Perhaps she was from the future after all. Either way, she was standing against this menace alone. It was no Jedi Master. She was young and inexperienced, but she was determined to try. Stay here, she ordered her little Padawan. Drawing her lightsaber at Agfing in a green blade, she advanced into the battle. Of course, this only pleased the Sith more. I'm insulted that you send bookish teenagers at me. Let's see how bookish she is with her head gone. That's it, folks. That's three excerpts from three different posts in this roleplay. Good luck finding it. Of course, the, the pauses are me taking out names. That would make it far too easy for most of you. So good luck. And let's get back to Richard Epcar. Who uh, passed away a uh, year ago and uh, who was a lovely, lovely person and brought me in one day who, to do uh, an audition. And it was for the Mortal Kombat versus DC Universe game. And basically, uh, I had Warner Brothers on the, on the horn and I had DC Comics on the horn. And basically, they said to me, Pick whatever characters you want and audition. So I picked all of the DC characters. I got to read, you know, Batman, Superman, all these characters I grew up with as a kid, you know, reading comics and everything. It was just wonderful. And then I got to read all the Mortal Kombat characters. So, uh, you know, basically she said to me at the end of it, she said, uh, they like you for everything. What what do you like? I said, you know, and I did the Joker. That was the first time I did the Joker. And I, I had never tried to do the Joker before. And it just this voice, this crazy voice came out of me and the laugh and everything. Just all, I don't even know where it came from, to tell you the truth. It was just like, it was like I was a, a basically a divic and a spirit was coming out of me and just doing this voice. It was really something crazy. And uh, I said to her, you know, the most fun character of all was the Joker. I would love to do the Joker. I mean, that was just amazing. And she said, yeah, you it sounded great. We'll, you know, we'll let you know and in a couple of days. They told me you're playing Raiden, the head of Mortal Kombat, and you're also playing the Joker. So I was really excited about that. And and a lot of people heard I was doing the Joker. They go, Richard Epcar is the Joker? They couldn't picture it because, you know, they just thought of my my normal, like, Bateau voice, you know. So uh, when it came out, people I think people were really pleasantly surprised. And there, I got a lot of great uh, responses as a result of it. And, uh, and as a result, I'll probably be doing it again. But I can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I guess uh, another one. You talk about how you'd want to work as Batman and so work, work with Batman and so on. So, has there ever been a a voice actor or um, director that you really wanted to work with? You know, like a Peter Cullen, or, or I, I guess if it's Batman, like Kevin Conroy or Mark Hamill, people like that. That anyone you really, really want to work with that you have not yet gotten to work with in your career? I actually got to work with Mark Hamill. I directed him in Shadow Chronicles. He was in that uh, movie. He had played uh, some little characters in that. And uh, so, yeah, he's a super nice guy, really, really nice guy. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I would love to work with all those people you mentioned. They're all wonderful, wonderful actors. I'd love to direct them all, and I'd love to, uh, I'd love to uh, work with. Uh, I, I'm trying to think. I mean, I've been as I've been doing this more and more. I get to work with all the people I want to work with, like Andre Romano and uh, uh, you know Chris Zimmerman. I just worked with on a game recently, and. Uh, uh, you know, um, what about like Tom Kane and Nolan North and I guess Jennifer Hale would be another big one. Um, never, never. I, I've worked with Nolan North on some things. We've, we've been on, we've appeared on, on several games together. Tom Kane, I did an, I did a convention with, he's a real character. And, uh, who was, the, oh, uh, Jennifer, I don't know. I have never, I don't think I've met her before. Oh, she's because I know she's worked a lot with Bioware. Well, she works with Bioware all the time now. Yeah, I know she's done an awful lot of stuff, you know, of late. Because she's basically when I think of a female voice actress, I usually think of her if it's serious. And then of course there's like Tara Strong and yeah, ones like that. I directed Tara on uh, Blue Dragon. We we worked with her for a couple of months on that. Um, but uh, Bioware, those guys always, I always leave uh, their sessions with no voice because there's a lot of screaming in those games. And I think that their whole thing is just basically screaming. You know? Well, I know one thing that uh, Jennifer Hale said is a problem with Bioware, not problem, but like one of the challenges with the Bioware games is it's like dubbing because your voice has to match what the character's lips are doing because right. if it doesn't, they have to do it again because... The way they the way they do their games, there's lots of different choices, and so you you can't ad lib, you can't change things. You have to do exactly as they say. Right, that's true. Okay, so I guess we have one last question. Okay, so the last one would be is um you know you've done a lot of a lot of different projects, a lot of different guests, and so on. So uh, the last thing I like to do is offer you the say the soapbox where you can promote anything you like. This includes any causes, charity work, current projects, films, games, 
or anything you want to tell a captive audience. So uh, the the soapbox is yours. You can share what you wish wow. to the wow. captive audience. Uh, soapbox for Richard Epcar. That's kind of scary. Um, well, hang on a second. I want to get. Uh, I should have brought this up earlier. I should bring up all this stuff. Where are they? I'm trying to find it. Boy, I'm, I'm well prepared, aren't I? Uh, well, off the first off the top of my head, I, all I can think about is that you know the elections are coming up soon. Uh, for those of us in the United States who are listening to this, and please go and vote. You know, uh, it's it's a it's a privilege and and it's something we all need to do, and uh, it's something that not everybody gets the opportunity to do in the rest of the world. So please go vote and uh, and be heard. Um, I want to just mention some conventions that I'll be at real, really quickly here. Uh, I mentioned to you I'm going to be at Anime in Nebraska Con, uh, November 2nd through the 4th. If you happen to be in Ireland, Ireland, I'll be uh, at Urticon, November 9th through the 11th in Dublin, Ireland, which we're really excited to be uh, going to, and uh, we're very excited about that. That one I'll be with my wife, Ellen Stern. Um, just be good to everybody. <laughs> be kind and and considerate and uh, and compassionate and don't hurt animals and let's bring the troops home. How's that for a soapbox? That's a, that's a pretty good soapbox. <laughs> so uh, we like to like to thank you for being on and uh, well, I was just surprised that you got held of, you know, we got hold of me today and we were able to do this because we've been bouncing oh, off I each know. other for and like I, a month and a half now. And I felt bad because I know you've uh, you've been emailing me and stuff and I I've just been crazy busy and I. Uh, I did want to do this for you, and I wanted to get together and do this uh, interview. And and you had sent me the uh, the questions before, and I just thought, well, it's it's going to be a little sterile if I do it that way. So it'd be more fun to talk to you, actually. So uh, I'm glad it all worked out. Oh, it did, and uh, thank you for being on. And uh, well, hope you have a good day, and uh, don't get too busy because I might get I might wear you out or something. <laughs> And then we hope to hear about the, your your Batman project in the future. Yes, yes, I'll be able to talk about it in the future. In the future. <laughs> anyway, when we hear about it. All right. And uh, have a good day. And thank you again. Thank you, Jeremiah. You too. All the best. And uh, and thank you, everybody, who's been uh, just wonderful to me. I just want to thank you for 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 coming up and saying hello and and uh, and appreciating what I do. I, I appreciate that. <laughs>